ever-changing world, Life Changes Network presents a voice of truth and inspiration, broadcasting on frequencies of love, laughter, and information, illuminating new paths for new directions as we, as one, strive for higher and higher planes of existence and a better understanding of ourselves and the world in which we live. Always remembering, Life Changes. This is radio like you've never felt before. This is Life Changes with Filippo. And now your host... Our MC, the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Ciao, everyone. I am Filippo. And, and normally I say I am excited uh, about uh, the show today. And, and though I am, I'm, I'm happy to be doing the show, and I know that this is an important subject, I know that this is a, t- a subject that touches home to way too many people. As a matter of fact, I believe that our guest has some statistics on this that are quite staggering. And the subject is um, uh, child abuse, child sex abuse, date rape, trafficking, etc., etc. We're talking about the book Tears and Fears, and our guest will be Wilma Davidson, who wrote the book. And as we are uh, getting ready to... Um, put this show together, a lot of thoughts were going through my head. And incidentally, about two weeks ago, uh, I found myself on a weekend um, not wanting to do anything um, like work. And uh, it wasn't a weekend, it was just one evening. And unfortunately, those evenings don't come often that I actually could take that time and just say, what would I want to do right now? And what I ended up doing is is finding myself on Netflix just looking for a movie. And this movie kept showing up and and it, it wasn't a movie that was recommended to uh, for me. It was just a movie that kept showing up and I kept seeing it and I kept looking at it saying, why am I interested in this movie? I might as well just click on it because there's something in this movie I have to watch. And within the first... 20 minutes, maybe a half hour at most, I was bawling like a child because I was remembering my childhood because the protagonist in the, in the movie was so much like I was when I was a child. And the child um, was difficult. Um, and as was I, I was difficult because I felt I wasn't understood. Um, I, and, and because I wasn't understood, I became difficult, even more difficult, whatever. Um, it's interesting that I actually shut the movie off and, and tried for a while. And then I went back to it because I couldn't wait to see how it ended because I, I tried to figure out my emotions and what was coming to me. I, I actually called a friend and shared what was coming to me was that, uh, being that child was so hard. Interestingly enough, I also was crying because I was looking at the parents and seeing that they were dealing with their issues and being those parents was difficult enough, being them, much less being the parents of a difficult child or a child that had certain difficulties. So I I just went through that whole emotion process, which was quite interesting to go through and watch the rest of the movie and, and um, glad I watched it. Um, but it's interesting that as we're getting ready for this show, nothing of this caliber was part of my life as a child. And though I think what I went through was bad enough and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, well, I don't have any enemies, but... Um, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. I, it, it's, it, it's nothing compared to what we're talking about here. At least I, I, I don't compare it. So I think how in this book, how Wilma talks about how she helps families uh, with the traumas, I think this is now several, several decades later, well, a few decades later, that I'm thinking back and still having remembering and still having and still shedding tears about that. At the same time, I was thinking about a friend of mine who adopted a little boy, and this little boy does not like to be around people, um, especially people with low voices, and uh, men in particular. And he, he he's still a baby, so he just cries whenever he hears a man speak other than his father, his adopted father, um, or the father that adopted him along with his wife. 
uh, my friend. And I think, you know, what might have happened to this, the, the woman who gave this child up? Was she raped? Did she have an abusive husband or an abusive boyfriend who abused her and the child picked up on that voice or that energy? And so I think of that as we're going into this show. And then last thing I also thought of when I was a kid, uh, I thought of some of the children that I knew and some of them that I didn't know because they they did not allow themselves to be known for some reason. There were the quiet ones or the shy ones, but there were also the ones that now looking back as an adult, I think there was something going on there. Um, the way they looked, the, you could just see now, I, it's vivid in my mind, their expressions were not natural to me now grown, grown up as an adult who has seen healthy, happy babies and young adults and children. And um, these were not children that, that had healthy childhoods. And so some of these issues might have been in theirs. And I'm 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 not going to stop to think if it if it was or not but it makes me think today as I go about my life that I see some of these things in the world and I wonder how would one help and I'm trusting that after we talk with Wilma Davidson today we'll all know right after this Clean water is not enough Reverse osmosis, distilled water, and most bottled waters are devoid of naturally occurring minerals. They are acidic, unstructured, and hard to absorb and rob minerals from the body. Ionways ionizers produce a super abundant supply of powerful antioxidants in each glass. Ionized water has a reduced molecular cluster size and a negative charge, hydrating you up to six times better. Water from an Ionways ionizer will help you restore your body to its natural pH balance, boosting your vitality. An ionized water more effectively flushes acidic toxins from within your body. Drink the healthiest water available today. Ionways Water Systems, their water changes everything. To learn more about Ionways Water Systems and how you can own one today, visit our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com and click on our sponsor page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, I am back. I am Filippo, and our guest today is Wilma Davidson. Tears and Fears is actually one of the two books that we will be discussing. Uh, Tears and Fears is a help guide for the families and victims of child sex abuse, date rape, and trafficking. Uh, that book actually has uh, come out as of a, shoo- a few short weeks ago. And uh, the author, who's with us now, is not only from Scotland, she is in Scotland. And God bless her, uh, it is 3 o'clock in the morning there, her time. And so we are glad that she is with us. She um, is an author of a number of other books and is one of the UK's experts on dowsing, actually, amongst other things. She has been a healer and a therapist for over 20 years, and during that time period helped many patients deal with the trauma of sexual abuse. She realized sex abuse was a very big subject, and her experience in this field encouraged her to write Tears and Fears to offer support to the many victims who need to find strength to cope with the memories of the trauma. Wilma, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you. Um, uh, okay. How big a subject is this? It is too big. It is one of these subjects that um, needs awareness to be created. Uh, when you think about it, the, the statistics say one in four girls and one in six boys have been abused. Now, if that number had become ill from chemicals and water or food, you know, it would be in all the headlines, we'd all be talking about it, and that something would be done. But this tends to get pushed under the carpet. I think a lot of people don't like talking about it. They feel guilty. And uh, so it's it always comes as a surprise when someone mentions it. Now, when I decided to write the book, I wasn't too sure about doing it, but 
a voice in my head had told me that was the subject for my next book. And I asked half a dozen girlfriends, whom each of them I'd known about 20 years, and I had coffee with them individually, and I said, guess what, I'm going to write this book on child sex abuse, expecting them to say, oh, for goodness sake. And out of the six, five of them said, oh, we can tell you about that. And one had been married to a paedophile. Another one had been raped by a market trader. One's father had gone to jail. And I couldn't believe this because these were women that I'd been close friends with for years, but the subject had never actually come up. Hmm. Why and do you I think, think? Well, I, I mean, I'd been abused by my grandfather, but it never entered my head to tell anybody. Hmm. And I, I think, you know, this is the same with most victims. They don't tell. Usually they've been told not to tell. And uh, even if you're told not to tell when you're a child... You, as you get older, you still automatically think, I shouldn't say anything. Mm. Yeah. You, you, you know, you said, you, you mentioned your grandfather. And now knowing you're a grandmother, my thought just went to uh, how, if, if thinking now as a, as a grandmother, uh, what happened to you as a child from a grandfather, what, what does that do to your thought process? Well, I'm very fortunate that when I realized that you know, I had th these experiences and I need to clear the memory, I went and had some hypnotherapy. So it hasn't actually affected me badly. Uh, but, you know, I have spoken to other people and they say that although it happened decades ago, uh, if they see an elderly gentleman with ridged fingernails or they see um, sort of nasal hair, anything like that, and suddenly, you know, they can start to shiver. And you'll get other people who are very unhappy going to the dentist because they don't like the feeling of this man leaning very close to them. Mm. So it's, um, you know, it affects different people in different ways. So are, are you saying that this is something that, that ev everybody should talk about? I mean, it's certainly not dinner conversation. How, how do you <laughs> think this should... <laughs> I got a laugh out of you on this, on this. <laughs> Well, I was just thinking at a dinner conversation, once you've had a few glass of wine, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if somebody mentions the subject, it'd be surprising, you know, what might come up at loosen people's tongues. Mm. And it's interesting because once you raise the conversation, people tend to open up. It's almost as though they're quite relieved to have the opportunity to talk to like-minded people about it. You know, I find this to be true for so many subjects that are considered taboo and people uh, have the need to talk about them. And, and as you're saying, had, had, if they were able to talk about them, they could be helped or it could be relieved in, at, at some level, for starters. Yes. Now, the interesting thing is you were saying about a dinner party, but that is a good time to talk about something like that because... It sort of takes the pressure off it, and you can talk about it a bit more lighthearted than you would if you hadn't had a glass of wine, and perhaps it loosens your tongue slightly <laughs> so that it comes easier to talk about it. Well, it's I, know not how, easy. I know how I'm going to do it now. I'm going to be at a dinner party, and I'm going to say, well, we had this guest, Wilma, Wilma Davidson, and she said uh, to bring this up. So here it goes. Who here? Right. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but seriously, um, be, because because the more the more we don't talk about it, the more taboo be, it becomes, and the more difficult it actually is for everybody uh, that has experienced this. Well, it takes the, the the energy from it by talking about it; it weakens it. Uh, because I think you know when you keep quiet about things, like that, it gives it power. So I think bringing it out in the open and letting people share it, it does lighten the energy. Do you think, uh, of course, we'll get a little bit into this uh, a little later on in the show, but do you think uh, talking about it also might help people um, uh, that, that might be inclined to be? Yes. Abused? I think it also helps people to sort it out in their own mind. You know, because... You tend to push it to the back of your mind. But when the subject gets raised, it gives you the chance to sort of clear some of it out and perhaps get it all into perspective. Hmm. Hmm. 
Okay, so so let's um, let's get a little bit more specific. Um, uh, it, it's interesting because I know you have a book coming out called The Porn Plague. And yes. It's, <laughs> and that's going to be out in about four weeks. And, and um, so it, it, it's interesting that you were saying how that ties in as well. So um, maybe we're going to get a little bit into both here. But, but, where, but where does this start? Because it seems like a vicious cycle. We were talking before the show, you and I, how some uh, abused children become the abusers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so where, how is this is this have you in your research did you find that this is like an age old thing yes i i think if you go back a few decades uh the there wasn't um, the sort of protection that there is now so men instead of using their wives and perhaps the risk of pregnancy they they would um you know use the the members of their family it's understandable that uh, you know when when there there wasn't uh, things like condoms available years ago. Uh, once you got ten children or thereabouts, you didn't really want any more. So this was a way around it. Also, the father was the head of the household, and everybody sort of obeyed the man. So you know, I I, I know some beautiful fathers. I mean, some wonderful people. I, I, I it just, I, I'm not a father, but it just seems unfathomable. So what, what is, is there something, was there something in the culture? And I'm sure we're not just talking a couple decades ago. We might be talking a couple centuries. Yes. Yes. I, I think, uh, going back in time, the man was very much the head of the household and, and everyone Sort of did what he, you know, he ordered, and that that was it. you didn't question it. And women weren't sort of respected the way they are now. And I think you know, girls are treated the same as boys now. But in years gone by, that the son was more important. So it's, it's interesting. So, so there was a, a time I, I know, um, even in uh, in my well, being Italian and hearing about some of the ancient Italian type of traditions that the, the man used to also beat his wife. But my understanding yeah. <laughs> is that most men don't do that in that culture anymore, at least uh, not in Italy is my understanding. So we don't do that um, here as, as, as a culture per se. Um, there is that abuse, but it's not expected and respected as it was then in Italy, for example, and now still is in other countries. So would, wouldn't one think that there'd be also less of this kind of abuse? It seems to be the other way around, that either there is more of it or it's just that it is more open now. Because there's no doubt about it, the media has uh, you know, helped to get it, create, to sort of help people talking about it. And certainly the internet has... Um, you know, people will talk to the internet because uh, it's somebody they don't know, so they'll speak to a stranger and offload. Which, in your book, I know that you that you say that leads to the child more easily becoming a victim eventually. That's right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, this is something that uh, potentially has been done for millennia uh, or centuries, and uh, as we've stopped other abuses of each other, obviously this is one that, that needs to be stopped. And what what is it that you say is a good way to go about that? Just the awareness alone, the talking about it. Yeah, and I think encouraging children to be children and not sort of appear as adults. I mean, today, so many 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds are dressing like adults and thinking like it rather than, you know, enjoying their childhood. And I think a lot of young young girls are being abused simply uh, because they're wearing their mini skirts and, uh, you know, they look inviting. And, of course, they go on the Internet and, you know, they pose as teenagers and uh, open the door, so to speak. Right, seemingly because they want to be adults or pretend they're older. And, and well, they're naive. It, yeah, and, and they're naive, yeah. Um, never, never thought of that. It, it's almost like uh, when girls used to play dress-up uh, before, now they actually do it for real. That's right. Um. But that's certainly not the case with the boys. So, wh- how how does that relate? 
But I think the boys are a really serious problem because boys don't talk about it and boys are taught that big boys don't cry. So because of that, uh, they, they keep quiet. They bottle it up inside them. And uh, the FBI report that uh, one in five boys or one in five young men have been abused before they reach 18. Now, that is a shocking number. And it's certainly one that's brushed very much under the carpet. But uh, a lot of young boys, as they get older, there's no support. And, uh, you know, the body is like a bucket from the day we're born. It carries all the emotions. Mm. And these sort of things, you know, they're suppressed. And then it just takes something to trigger it off. And they end up needing to have anger management or hypnotherapy to cope with the problems. And, of course, they often suffer from inner anger or guilt. Guilt's a big one with boys. And shame. And you you can understand it. And, of course, this in turn leads to depression and self-harm. And it can lead to suicide. And, of course, they do need to have a lot of inner child work done to try and build up this confidence and many of them have a fear of public toilets. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it, it's reminding me of, uh, well, how often we hear on the news, especially in this country, about the abuse of priests on, on, on boys and how these are adults now speaking up who, with families of their own. And the, the little that I've seen either on TV or interviews or what have you, uh, it, it, it's hard to watch because you see their inner struggle and you know they've been carrying that all this time, uh, consciously or subconsciously. And here they are years later trying to live a normal life and still still not be able to. You're right. Mm-hmm. Well, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatric, they state that uh, you can keep re-experiencing the trauma. So, I mean, some of these young lads, they will be going over it in the mind and they keep re-experiencing it. And they end up, they can become very withdrawn and quiet or depressed. And the schoolwork starts to suffer. And some of them have bad dreams which keep being repeated. So it's, um, you know, I think the, the male problem is very much underestimated. People just don't realize how much uh, young men in the past have suffered. I mean, fortunately, it's been talked about now, and hopefully uh, the restrictions are being put in place so that uh, you know, churches and things like that are not, uh, it's not happening, but it, it is scary just how many men, because these are the companies, the country's leaders. You know, these are the men who are going to be in industry, be the boss and so on. So it's going to affect them if they've got all this on the back of their mind. And once it's in your subconscious, it stays there until you're ready to cope with it. So you might find that it happens to you when you're five years of age. But it's when you get to 30 that it suddenly bubbles to the surface and has to be dealt with. Why, why would it bubble to the surface at 30? Well, I mean, it, it, uh, I think it comes to the surface at the time that your mind is able to cope with it. So mm. I mean, it, 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 you may be 60. I mean, I have come across people who have been, you know, fairly near retirement age and suddenly uh, this, this crisis comes and... Uh, it can be other events that trigger it off. You know, perhaps you've gone to a certain place and you see somebody and it reminds you of that place or that person, or it can be a smell. Uh, surprising, actually. You, the memory uh, remembers all sorts of things, and uh, it can be something which appears quite unimportant. It can trigger the whole thing off. You know, like the smell of rubber or... <laughs> right, right. Yeah, ed- anything. So there you go. You know, it, it, it just, it seems like we're all over the place here. Uh, 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 and, and because it's, it's hard to, well, we're, we're touching on a subject that I've se- certainly not really talked about often. I've had some friends who have broached the subject with me about their experiences, but e- even then it, it, it's hard. It, it, it's hard to, like, like I've met the parents of my friends who, who have been accused and have been in jail or, or what have you. And, 
and they seem like nice people and they seem like everyday normal people and 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 yet my friend's life had been ruined for you know what i mean it, it's just hard exactly. to get my mind around all this well, that's right i mean my grandfather was the pillar of society you know he was a well respected businessman in the town and uh, like a lot of these people very plausible and i would imagine that you know most of his friends would have been very surprised to find out you know the sort of things that he did and i suspect that that is quite typical because of the numbers of victims there must be an awful lot of people doing it right well uh when we come back we're going to talk about how to deal with this after it's happened we've talked a little bit about how to hopefully well and not enough i i mean it, it, there's just obviously not enough time to to really delve into this and that's why the book is here tears and fears which you can get at tearsandfears.com um, but when we come back, Wilma, you do uh, help your clients or have helped for many years as well uh, deal with the trauma, right? Right. Okay. And so you're going to help us deal with this trauma now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's time for a glass of wine. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Why, why don't we do that? And we'll be back <laughs> right after this with Wilma Yeah, Davis. that'd be good. There are self-help seminars costing thousands of dollars guaranteeing miraculous transformations. There are compelling speakers and life-changing weekend experiences where you can walk on fire. They all deliver revelations that guarantee you'll come back for the more expensive revelations filled with even greater wonder next month on Fiji. We get addicted to positive, heartfelt, expensive theater. What we really need is a jumpstart, an awakening, someone who can give us a reminder that everything we need lies within. Through inspiration and practical knowledge, Dorothy Donahue helps people get grounded and motivated, inspired and energized. It's not just words and affirmations and the power of intention. It's a mindset brought about by a tangible, transcendental experience, an audiovisual, physical, spiritual experience that helps us realize we transform ourselves. We get tools to become the conscious co-creators of lives of unlimited potential. Find out more. Go to DorothyDonahue.com. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with our host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can hear tonight's show and all our past shows, which include luminaries such as David Wilcock, Mariel Hemingway, Giorgio Sukalos, Marcy Shymoff, and Shadow Stevens on our archive page at our website at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O dot com. Remember, you can also connect with us via Twitter and Facebook and now in our own community at lifechangesnetwork.com where real people come together to share real life in real time. That's lifechangesnetwork.com. And we're back. And I'm Filippo, and our guest today is Wilma Davidson, who's written the book Tears and Fears, which is a helpful guide for the families and victims of child sex abuse, date rape, and trafficking. If you want to learn more about Wilma and her book, and get her book at www tearsandfears.com. Now, she also has another book coming out in about four weeks, and that is The Porn Plague. And she'll be able to tell us a little bit about that uh, closer to the end of the show. But, um, Wilma, since, uh, y you know, one thing that I was thinking about during the break is that um, when you and I were talking before the show, you are so funny, and you're so jovial and, and, and laughing and all of that. And here you've also shared, which I, I, I wasn't aware of, about your own uh, sexual abuse experience uh, as a victim. So uh, it's not too late to have a happy childhood. And that's quite true. And, and, and I'm sorry, and, and to be healed uh, as much as possible from this. Yes. I, I think there comes a time when you are ready to be healed. And once you recognize that there is a problem, then you can, you can deal with it. And there's lots of help available. But uh, until you actually become aware that you do need help, 
then uh, you know you just keep going on with it bottled up inside you. And I think this is why so many people suffer from depression and uh, all sorts of other emotional problems because they've got all this inner anger. Mind you, I'm not saying that everyone who's depressed has been abused, <laughs> but it, you know you do bottle up inside and. Uh, People are beginning to realize now that there are a lot of therapies and they can release that sort of thing. And, you know, things like emotional freedom technique, ta- you can tap it away or you can have uh, therapy or you can meditate and find out what it's all about. And, uh, you know, people like Dorothy can help. Uh, a- absolutely. Uh, and she too has had her own experiences here. You're very intuitive. Um, um, uh, and so what, what, is it, what is it that you do specifically or what is it you say or, or where do you guide some of the uh, trauma victims and families through your therapy? Well, I, I tend to um, work on the principle of letting them talk. You know, I, I, do, I do healing and uh, if they're meant to talk, if it's the right time, then they will release it. Because one of the, the things about this subject is you cannot push somebody because there is a right time and a wrong time. And uh, until they are actually ready to release it, you can't do very much without risking harming them. You know, um, I did a, a therapy weekend once. Uh, well, it wasn't therapy, but it was a, one of, a, a method that, that somebody was teaching that I actually got a lot out of. Um, and, and I just want to run this by you. W- one of the techniques uh, was that, uh, well, two, twofold. One was that uh, the people that had had these horrible experiences, uh, he brought them back, or us, each in our own uh, different experiences, um, to the experience and, and made us look for what good was in it. And surprisingly, through the experiences that I thought were difficult and hard to deal with, I actually found some good, which didn't really help, in my opinion, but I found it. Um, but then he he actually um, had us uh, focus on the good and see how that extended into the rest of our life and how our life had changed, those of us who felt our lives had changed for the good because of it and then be grateful for the fact that this was what actually turned our life in that way. In my case, it did work that way. Could it work that way in every case? Yes, I think that once you face the problem and release it, you become stronger. And when you've had a, an experience like that, when you look back, you realize that you, you are much stronger. At the time, it's all a bit of a nightmare. But you do come out of it much stronger once you've sort of looked at the emotional side of it. And there are so many things that start it all off. And one of the problems nowadays is um, that the children are sort of putting themselves in a situation where they're vulnerable. You know, they're doing things like uh, texting or sexting, should I say, (laughs) when Mm. they're sending photographs of genitals to each other. And yeah, it's all a great joke and they must have some fun trying to take the photographs. But... You know, that it means that these photographs are passing around among their friends and uh, can, can cause a lot of problems. In fact, in America, the, I expect you've heard in Pennsylvania, some children have been charged by the police and in Florida, and it's becoming a real problem. So, of course, when people start doing things or when children start doing texting, it's, it's making them vulnerable without them realizing it. And it's the same with the chat rooms. That's making them vulnerable. So it's, I mean, they, these are problems that weren't there a few years ago. So there's, s- there's, there's new ones coming up all the time. So you see this as potentially a, a bigger problem than it ever was? Yeah, well, it's different. It's changing. The internet has changed it in that suddenly uh, it's easier for pedophiles. And, uh, of course, the children think they're being very grown up and streetwise and so on, when in actual fact they're not. <laughs> but because, you know, you go through this stage of being very immature but thinking you're mature, and that's when they're vulnerable. But, of course, they di- this sort of thing has only happened in recent years. So that that's causing a lot more casualties. Well, so... Uh Obviously, parents can't control, uh, and this goes into your other book, uh, um, 
the the porn book actually, uh, oh, which yes. is called the Porn Plague. Um, mm-hmm. But parents can't control uh, what children do on the internet, even if they put controls. I'm sure the kids are smarter than than they are when it comes to computers and can figure out how to take them off. So there's well, that's there's, right. Well, seventy one percent of children in the UK have. Um, an online profile, and something that uh, one-third of them have their computer in their bedroom, which, of course, is not good news because the the parents don't have the control over what they're watching. And I know in Canada, uh, something that 70% of females and 90% of males in the 13 to 14 age group have accessed explicit contents. And, of course, this puts ideas in the head and makes them feel very grown up. And... uh, I mean, it's, it really is quite a problem. In London, the, the Portman Clinic, which is a worldwide well-known, uh, a third of the young patients are there for porn addiction. <laughs> and, uh, it suddenly brings it home to you, you know, that things have changed in my day as a child. And, of course, the websites nowadays, the, um, if children click on something like My Little Pony or Pokemon or Action Man, yeah. 30% of these sites are actually hardcore sites and uh, you know the the children are fooled into opening them up and you know barbie and uh, the jonas brothers there's quite a lot of them have got sites which um, they're just using their names and when the kids open them up there they are so this of course makes the children much more aware because I certainly wasn't aware of all these things when I was a 12, 14 year old. So times are changing. So you're not saying aware as in, in the good sense. And if you are, it's a double edged sword, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, that they, they become very aware long before they should be. Hmm. So, because, yes, go no, on. go on. No, no, go on. Well, the, What's happening now is a lot of children who have been abused uh, are falling back to self-harm. And self-harm is becoming very, very common. And, of course, a lot of them, they hide it. You know, so they do it in places where where it's not seen. But uh, it it is a real problem. And uh, they've got their lack of self-worth, a lot of them. And they feel that nobody's listening and uh, that they don't, it's all bubbling up inside them. And this can go on for years. So it's it's a problem which it needs an awful lot of exposure, and there's so many different avenues. You know, it's all the different facets of it, and the sex abuse is not just in America or the UK. Uh, it's it's been happening in Belgium and Germany, Austria, Switzerland, uh, Australia, and of course Ireland. Uh, I think was the one that sort of started all the publicity off with the priests. And did us all a great favor because it opened up the subject so that people talk about it more. And I think this is what it needs is for us all to start talking and uh, sort of helping to create more awareness. Yeah, I think um, I I, I don't know if there's a club of of men that that pride themselves in in this kind of behavior, but certainly I, I know that in certain cultures, like we talked about before, a man was expected to uh, a beat or abuse uh, his wife, etc. And and if he didn't, then he wasn't considered a man, etc. So in in a similar way, um, or a, a, against that way, I, it, it needs to be known that this is not cool. That's right. Well, I think, you know, the business um, with the priests worldwide, that was like the 100th monkey syndrome. You know, you teach a few monkeys how to do something and then monkeys in other parts of the world can all do it. And it seems to have been the same thing uh, with the churches and um, the, the, the priests because every country seems to have been having enormous problems. And uh, that now, of course, you've probably read all about the millions of dollars that's being paid out to victims of course, right. these victims will, will never have a normal life because the damage has been done. So, uh, well, and n- no, let's let's hope that they can because um, you seem to be having a beautiful life. Thank you. Yeah. So- See, one of the problems we haven't mentioned is the fact that a lot of the children who have been abused and a lot of the children who get involved through sexting, etc., 
uh, is the transmitted diseases. Now, th- this is quite scary because there's something like 19 million new diagnosed cases each year. And uh, U.S. has the highest in the industrial world. And it's, it's, it's a problem because some of these diseases are not sort of instantly diagnosed so you can be a victim and not realize that you, you've got chlamydia or something like that so that that's another side of this abuse which needs a bit more publicity uh, you, you know uh, Wilma with every problem that you mention it just it, it it seems like it's going up exponentially where this is this is a bigger problem than than we we seem to have answers for at the moment well, that's right. I think children and, and people, adults who have been abused, they're three times more likely to suffer depression. Uh, the statistics say they're six times more likely to have post-traumatic stress at some time. And, uh, you know, a lot of them uh, go to alcohol abuse and 26 times more likely to have drug abuse. And then, of course, there's always the few that um, become suicidal. So it's... Um, it's a big subject. You know, we could talk every night of the week about it. I, I suppose, and and uh, and maybe have millions of people that might be willing to talk about it. And and according to you, that actually would be a, a good thing, um, because come to think of it, not everybody either can afford or knows how to go get help or therapy, uh, like we've talked about. But talking about it is a good start, right? Yes. I think once you talk about it... To the right you people. Have a, you, yes, but you then have a feeling of relief that you're actually talking about it and telling somebody because it's for so long you've been keeping it within and not telling us all. And it is a relief to a lot of people when, when they can sort of start to release it. Well, you know, Wilma, that that just that, that touches on something that for me, I wish we could all, as a as a civilized adult com- community of the world, start talking about so many things and and get rid of these taboos of of men are not supposed to think that or cry or this or that or women aren't That's supposed right. to talk like that or blah blah blah, and and so this leads to that to, for me. Yes. But you seem to be doing not only well, but you could talk about just anything if you could talk about this, and you could talk about porn. And what did your lady friends think of you? Uh, think of the subject of porn, by the way, when you brought brought that up. Well, of course, I tend to laugh my head off when I'm talking about it because <laughs> I see the funny side of it. You know, I I looked at some of the the porn sites because I thought if I'm going to write about it, I really must have an idea of what I'm talking about. And I found it was just a joke because there was no romance about it. There was nothing, nothing nice. It just, some of it just looked, uh, it wasn't very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I must admit, I, I did find the whole thing quite entertaining. But <laughs> the trouble is, kids, you know, they're, they can be easily impressed. And it does make them feel very grown up. And, of course, when they tell the tr- their friends what they've seen, it gives them street cred. So you can understand how this thing becomes Mm -hmm. quite popular with kids. Mm. Yeah, I can understand. Uh, I can understand what you're saying now. I still can't understand or wrap my mind around everything that we've talked about today, but it it means that uh, that's something that we'll need to talk about more and and hopefully in so doing help a lot more people uh, since this is uh, such a such a big problem. So Wilma, thank you then for writing uh, Tears and Fears. Uh, the book Tears and Fears is available at tearsandfears.com. And, and, actually, and, and Amazon. Oh, and it's Amazon, on, that's great. Oh, yes, it's on, it's on Amazon and yes. all the other internet uh, sites. And will the, the porn it, blog uh, uh, plague be there as well, the porn plague? Oh, yes, yes, it will be there in four weeks' time. Okay. The thing about this book is, it, you know, it's a, it's a must-read book because people need to be aware because this problem can happen anywhere to any of us at any time. And it's the same with the trafficking. You know, it can happen uh, to the person next door. You just don't know. So it's good to, to read this and be aware. And without <laughs> trying to sound conceited, uh, I think that uh, these two books are two of the most important books in health published this century. 
in that they are taking the lid off subjects that need to be exposed. Well, thank you for exposing them, Wilma, and thank you for getting up in the middle of the night in order to do that with us on air. Well, it's been a pleasure. I've really <laughs> enjoyed it. I, I love your dulcet tones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, thank you. I thank you very much. I appreciate that. And and I appreciate you. And uh, please do stick with and, and listen to our producer's rap as, as Mark and I try and wrap our minds around what we just talked about right after this. Life Changes with Filippo is a premier radio show presented by Life Changes Network, which is a company whose team has dedicated their lives not only to positive change, but to helping others observe and embrace, honor, and even celebrate their own changes, thus enabling a more positive, inspired life and helping to create a more positive and inspired world. From everyday people to corporate giants, celebrities, and children, we are here to help and to serve. With heart and experience, we bring our message and positive intent into your home or corporate office and even through appearances on your favorite shows. If you wish to learn more about Life Changes Life Coaching and a private consultation with one of us, corporate event appearances, or if you would like us to appear on your radio or TV shows, visit LifeChangesWithFilippo.com and click on our representation page. You are listening to Life Changes with Filippo on the BBS Radio Network with your host, Filippo Voltaggio. You can visit us online via Twitter and Facebook and at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, we're back. I am Filippo, and this is the Producer's Wrap, where I'm joined by our producer, Mark Lejure, after this great conversation with Wilma Davidson. Well, great. I mean, it was great. But the subject, wow. One in four and one in six. Yeah. That is staggering. And, and that was, uh, I was reflecting on that while listening to the two of you talk in the background and thinking about the number of people I know that right. have, as she was saying, that have, you know, either themselves or someone, you know, in their family or have a friend who's, Great grandfather was a Vatican priest that had been uh, released from uh, uh, or excommunicated or, or whatever the proper term would be at the time, um, and this was way before the the recent wave of uh, disclosures. And uh, you know the the thing that she was talking about with the internet being um, you know making it uh, more accessible or making it easier for pedophiles, but at the same time, I do. You believe that that if nothing else, that uh, the episode with the church showed that it existed, that mm. it's been around in such large numbers, and thank God for the internet because it was able to disclose that. So I think it's making it more, more difficult as well by by bringing transparency to the to mm. the forefront. One could only hope, and you know, uh, it just made me think of that comment I made earlier uh, about. Um, the the therapy where you look at uh, the situation, at, at, at the, the victimization, and then try and find some good in it. Um, that that's certainly something that we can try and do a- afterwards. But we hope that people don't have to learn and find their good that way. I certainly wouldn't have liked it. You know, I, I mean, I can't imagine. I'm just saying that it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help the people who. Who, who can't see that good, but, but, but at the same time, um, we would rather people found good another way <laughs> than to have to go through that. Well, of course, and I think it really goes down to this being a symptom of, of a much greater fundamental right. issue, which is a lack of nurture or the presence of neglect. Mm. Mm. You know, especially in this material, you know, consumer based um, society where, you know, kids are killing for Nikes uh, and, 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 and video games and things of this nature. And, and, and parents are in such a hurry and it's a rush and, and you're going to wait there. And now the latest thing is the, uh, um, I can't remember the term, but it's present, uh, present absence or where, where parents are on their phones and on their smartphones and, and they're there, but they're not. Oh, right. You know, the, the nurture isn't there. There isn't a connection with the kids. And, and it comes, you know, you, you look at what would be the driving force for this and it's, 
it's power control, right? Uh, there, there's aspects that, that clearly the, uh, the perpetrator is, is lacking um, or attention. Uh, so something that they didn't get. And, and this is learned behavior. You know, I, I, I like just like you said, how you think this is part of a bigger problem, and 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 it is, and it and it's even part of a bigger problem and a bigger problem, and 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 I just think, wow, if we are having these discussions in our generation and Wilma and her generation uh, of of the experiences she had and that we've had or we know friends have had. Just think of the kids that are growing up today w- with all the things that Wilma mentioned. What is what is the world going to be like? What are they going to be like when they're our age and and we're her age? Well, we gotta we gotta hope that that what at least you and I believe in, and in, in, in the fact that consciousness is continuing to expand and raise, and an awareness of these issues being talked about. By us and, and others, you know, bringing it to the forefront and the work, work that uh, you know Wilma and others are doing, I, I, you got to hope that that's going to turn the table and that eventually we will grow and relearn nurture and and putting families first and and putting the phone down or, or taking time away from the office or or changing your lifestyle so that you're present. And I, I've never seen anybody want to hurt another human being be, while they're in a state of being loved. Right. Mm-hmm. If you're in a state of being loved and you're you're being nurtured and you're being satisfied, you don't. There's there's no drive. There's no catalyst for turning around and hurting someone else. Mm-hmm. It, it, that always seems to manifest from again neglect or or or, or lack of attention or, or nurturing. You know. Uh... Mark, that's so profound. And, you know, I was, um, I, I went to a store to, to buy something this, uh, weekend and, um, it, it, they didn't have what I, what I needed. And I just, I had a little time and I walked around the whole store, uh, thinking that, oh, I'll just get something else. And, you know, it might be fun to have something new or something. And there was nothing in the store that I needed. And, and it's not like I have a lot of things, but it was nothing that I needed. And yet I could see where all the items that were looking at me or that I could, I was looking at all had been advertised as if I did need it. And I thought, no, I really don't, as I, as I thought about it. And I thought, well, wait a minute. What about the people who really think they do and who can't afford them? Then they have that problem on top of everything else. And though it's kind of unrelated, it's related because we keep thinking we need things when all we, all we need is love. Do, 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 do. <laughs> well, it, it's so true. I mean, when it goes back to the, to the, to the basics and you think about, you know, the native peoples, the Aboriginal peoples, and, and you think of what life must have been like when it was simply about living, you know, when you're in a, a tribal environment and that is your goal is to, to, you know, you, you wake up and you survive and you eat and you nurture and, and this, this, the life is the central aspect right just being alive is the central aspect now you know we've learned all these tricks as to how the brain works and how to get the the, the chemistry going and how to to create a state of need in the body and and mind and you put those two together and it turns into uh, you know a, a, a continuity based product and uh you know what a distraction from that central aspect of just being alive Wow. You know, Mark, that's interesting because that reminds me of a study that I just read recently. I think it was between the French and the Americans. And the French knew little about what how many calories were in their food, what was, what was considered a diet food and which was considered, uh, what was considered a fattening food. They knew little about that compared to the Americans who knew a lot about that. But the study was showing how everybody tested um, that didn't know about that in France was it is so much thinner and quote-unquote healthier 
than the American counterparts who knew so much about it. Knowing about something does it, it, it does not equal being able to to experience health or knowing about love does not equal experiencing love. And I, I tried to make the analogy, and I think I just lost myself. But do, do you know where I was going with that? Well, I understand what you're saying. I, it also points to another to to another aspect, which I think is a, a part and parcel to this this same theme, which is the fact that there's a the, we're we're taught in these juxtapositions. We are taught, you know, where you can do certain things, or you're supposed to have certain behaviors around your family, but then you go out into the business world, and oh, it's just business, survival of the fittest, right? Mm-hmm. And kill or be killed, and conquer your enemies, and and so you're you're brought up in a battlefield environment. Yet then you're supposed to turn that way of relating off when you go home, mm-hmm. and and. And you really, I don't believe you can completely disconnect the two because, again, there's learned behaviors. There's things that you do instinctually. There's things that you do based on habit. And so there's action reaction. And, and I think a lot of these things play out at home, which they probably wouldn't if we weren't brought up to compete a certain way in, in our schools and, and, and compete a certain way in our businesses. And, and you know, that, that old uh, kicking the cat thing, you know, when, when, when you get home. Uh, you know, I, I think this is all part of the same situation where if we can get to the other side of the shift and, and, and realize a creative collabor- collaborative environment where we are actually relying on one another and, and, and working t- together and, and gaining strength through a combined and a collective effort, that now points back to healthy behaviors in the family because you're now relying on one another, right? You're nurturing, you're giving, you're, you're taking the best that each one has to offer in order to, to achieve whatever goal, task, lifestyle it is that, that uh, you set out for. Mm. Wow. That's, and there it is. And, and actually, and, and living by example, and I think Wilma, from what I understand, has three beautiful children that she gets along with and five grandchildren that she loves and gets along with. And, and she's able to have this, this life um, even after being victimized. And uh, now she helps other people or has been for so many years and is living an exemplary life. So it is possible. You're right, Mark. I agree that, that I, I, see consciousness shifting uh, for the better thanks to people like her and people like us and uh, and people like you who are all trying. So thank you all for being part of Life Changes with Filippo. I thank uh, Mark Lejeune, our producer, and our Dorothy Donahue, our producer, Wilma Davidson, our guest, and Seth Hendricks, our engineer, for being part of this world, being part of all the positive changes we'd like to see in this world. Ciao, everyone. You have been listening to Life Changes with Filippo with the master of change, Filippo Voltaggio. Listen live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the BBS Radio Network and visit us online at lifechangeswithfilippo.com. That's Filippo, F-I-L-I-P-P-O. Today's show has been made possible in part by our sponsors, Ionways Water Systems, Change Your Water, Change Your Life, and Love and Miracles with Dorothy Lee Donahue. To learn more about them, visit the sponsor page of our website. Once again, join us here next week as we consciously explore and embrace the only constant, life changes. Change the world, change the world.